Welcome to Breaking History. I'm Tim Hubner. I serve as the chair of the board of editors of the Journal of Supreme Court History. I'm joined today by Professor William Meyer, who is associate professor of geography at Colgate University, and he is the author of a very interesting article, Justice Samuel Nelson and Judicial Reputation, and that article is found in volume 48, number three, the one that looks like this, just out. Volume 48, uh, number three of the Journal of Supreme Court History. It's a pleasure to have you on, uh, Professor Meyer. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, uh, interesting thought I had as I looked at your article and looked at your bio. And as I just said, you're an associate professor of geography. How does a professor of geography get interested in a Supreme Court justice? Uh, um, two ways, actually. One is one has nothing to do with geography, and that's um, legal studies. Legal history has been always been a kind of hobby of mine. So, in a sense, it's a break from my usual work. Um, the other is, though, there's a there's a geographical connection with with Samuel Nelson. Um, I grew up in upstate New York, central New York. Um, I teach here. I've I've come back here to live. And Nelson was a native of the of upstate New York, and he spent most of his life. Um, his his residence was in Cooperstown, which is less than an hour away from here in Hamilton. Um, so one of the one of the ways my my interests have come together is um, studying, investigating the legal history of cases and legal figures who have something to do with this region, and Nelson you know, fits right into that. And your article makes the case for the significance of Justice Nelson. Um, as you know, uh, when we think about the Supreme Court in the 19th century, especially in the early to mid 19th century, there are a lot of justices whose names are not exactly household words. Um, these are justices that we not very frequently publish articles about mm -hmm. in the journal. And yet uh, you're making the argument for the significance of Nelson. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Why is Justice Samuel Nelson significant? Yeah, um, I would say he he represents um, particularly well um, a, a model of the judicial role and a conception of what the proper um, the proper work, the proper actions of a justice is. Um, and that's one I, I use the word in the article. If you had to sum it up in a single word, it would be lawfulness. Um, somewhat longer, the rule of law. Um, it's it's a it's a conception that the role of the judge is to decide particular cases in an appellate appellate justice um, to do so on the basis of a careful understanding of what the law was was understood to be at the time. Um, on the basis of existing precedent and existing understanding, and that it's sharply distinguished from policy making and law making, which um, in this conception are are seen as the the proper um, activities of other branches of government. So, um, if if you if you use that standard, if you if you judge just judges in that way, I think arguably. Um, Nelson emerges better from um, from the application of that standard than the best known justices that he served with. Um, and I, those I think would be would be Curtis, would be Taney, um, Chase, Miller, Bradley, Field. Um, arguably, I think he he um, he observed that standard of lawfulness, the rule of law, more consistently more impartially um, than any of them did. And so that I think, you know, that both he both expressed it and he also, I think, lived up to it. Um, so that's that's my argument for him as a as a justice worth studying. And, and uh, well, please, I, go ahead. I, if if um, if that's the if that's what a judge or a justice should be, then arguably the best training for a Supreme Court justice is previous experience um, in, in other courts, um, but within the judicial branch. 
And Nelson, when he was appointed to the court, he actually had more judicial experience, I think, than anyone else in the, in the 19th century. And I think more than almost anyone else ever appointed to the court. And so, I, you know, obviously that if, if that's if that's the the model for what a judge should do and be, that's presumably the best training for being on the highest court. The other interesting thing about his background is that he had almost no experience of any other sort. But he had never been a cabinet member. He had never been a state legislator. He had never been a member of the House of Representatives or the Senate. And there's been a lot written about um, the advantage of that kind of experience for a Supreme Court justice. And, you know, there's something to it, but I don't think there's been nearly enough said about the disadvantages, which is that if you have that kind of experience, you may be tempted to bring, you know, the, the habits of mind that are appropriate to the legislative branch or the executive branch, bring those onto the bench. And that's, you know, that would, at least from, from, Again, the, the point of view of that um, that model of the judge's proper role, um, those are not appropriate uh, things to bring to the bench. Those are not appropriate ways to think about. Um, those are for other the other branches of the government, not not for the judge. Yeah, I mean, that's such an interesting point. I mean, as you say, it was pretty unusual in the 19th century for mm -hmm. justices of the Supreme Court to have had prior judicial experience. I mean, mm -hmm. you think about some of those important figures of the day, mm -hmm. Tawney, and even going back to mm -hmm. John Marshall, they, they had not been judges before, mm -hmm. right? And yep. they did come out of this sort of political world. And, mm -hmm. and so it's an interesting argument that that Nelson exhibited this sort of lawfulness and that that came from his prior training mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. judge. Um, mm -hmm. um, Nelson served from 1845 to 1872. And of course, mm -hmm. right in the middle of that period mm -hmm. is the best known case mm -hmm. probably that that we associate with sure. Justice Nelson. And that is, of course, Dred Scott versus Sanford mm -hmm. from 1857. To what extent was Justice Nelson's behavior in that case mm -hmm. um, um, important in shaping his reputation as mm -hmm. a justice, because this is an issue that yep. you tackle specifically mm -hmm. in your article. Yep. Um, I mean, certainly it's done his reputation no good that he ended up um, on the side of the majority as far as disposing of the particular case. So he ruled in favor of Sanford rather than Scott. Um, he was, on the other hand, the only member of the majority who disassociated himself from all of the most controversial uh, stances that, that Justice Ta Chief Justice Chani took um, in his opinion for the court. Um, so he, um, when people write about the case, um, they if they do it very quickly and briefly and superficially, they say, you know, Nelson was part of the majority, and that makes it sound like he was associated with those those very controversial positions um, that Tani took. Um, if they go a little deeper into it, they make it sound as if he was just trying to evade the the issues by finding a technical a, a technicality to rule on and avoid those those matters. Um, if you if you look carefully at the opinions, I I did this not only in this briefly in this article, but at greater length in another article um, published also this year. Um, if you look at his reasons, if um, for taking the stance he took. Um, they are arguably, I think, sounder, um, better reasoned than the, the positions taken by either the majority or the two dissenters, Curtis and McLean. Um, and if it's, it's, you can actually think about the case in a different way. Um, if you think about it as a case about whether federal judicial authority should be expanded or not, um, then it turns out it's an eight to one decision. Um, it's the entire court saying yes and Nelson saying no. The difference is the six other justices and the majority 
saying it should be expanded at the expense of Congress. Um, the court should have the right to strike down laws like, in this case, the Missouri Compromise Act, um, on the grounds that they exceed its proper authority. If you look at the two dissenters, Curtis and McLean, they are arguing that the court should have novel and unprecedented authority to overrule and to second guess state courts. Um, in this case, the court, the state Supreme Court of Missouri. Nelson is the only one who argued for the existing understanding that yes, Congress had the authority to pass the Missouri Compromise Act, but that the state of Missouri also had the authority to determine the status of people living within it. Um, so, you know, for judges, especially for, the, for a final, a court of absolutely final resort, like the Supreme Court, there's always a temptation to expand its reach, to expand its authority, um, to make it the ultimate sensor of, you know, what's good policy and what's good law. And I think it's it's very interesting that in this case, Nelson stood alone in refusing that temptation, that invitation to step into this political controversy and resolve it the way he felt he felt it should be resolved, and instead said, no, I'm going to stick with the existing understanding of what the authority of the court is, and I'm not going to go beyond that. Um, and I think, I mean, going back to the question of his reputation, I think if that were understood better, which is what I've tried to, to emphasize, um, he emerges certainly better than Tani and colleagues, but also more uh, more attentive to lawfulness and the rule of law than even the two dissenters, um, whose points against the majority, I think, were very well taken, but who whose points against Nelson's own stance were less so. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a very interesting issue that you address, and it 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 goes beyond what Nelson does in Dred Scott. I mean, mm -hmm. this sort of larger question of how we assess or mm -hmm. how judicial reputations are formed, mm -hmm. how they are made, and how we assess judicial impact and mm -hmm. significance. And I think that your article really touches on all of those questions, even in a larger sense. Maybe you can say something about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would... I would draw a distinction between, to use your words, impact and significance on the one hand and judicial quality on the other, because they don't necessarily go together. I mean, you can be, judge, judges can have enormous impact on the law and they can be enormously significant in the history of the law. And yet one can still raise serious questions about the validity of their reasoning and about the, the grounds that they had um, for ruling and and reasoning in the way that they did. So I think, you know, from the historical point of view, it makes a lot of sense to emphasize those who had lots of impact because, you know, as historians, we're mostly interested in what happened. Um, we're not grading like we're grading our students. I mean, we are not um, handing out commendations and demerits. Um, so if a judge... If a justice had a lot of impact, then yeah, um, affected the law enormously, remade the law to some extent in his or her own image, that's very worthy of historical attention and maybe especially worthy of it. Um, but that should not be confused with whether a judge, a justice um, made, a, made a valid case, accurately characterized the precedents and the state, the understanding of the law at a particular time. And that, I mean, it's it's easy to it's easy to to conflate the two and think, okay, the judge the justices who've gotten the most attention, those must be the best ones because they, you know, they had the most impact. Um, but that's that's precisely what I'd like to question. I mean, so I think Nelson arguably was an excellent justice. Um, and and yet arguably did not have did not leave a very deep personal imprint on the law um, and that those it may sound paradoxical but those are both true at the same time well and and so if i could just push you on that mm -hmm. a little bit so sure. so 
so you're arguing that Nelson was a great justice. Um, and how do we assess that? I mean, this is one of these <laughs> yeah. age old questions, right? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we know judicial greatness if it's not simply justices who made rulings that fit with our mm -hmm. own opinions in our own day mm -hmm. and time, which is which is certainly how a lot of what has been written about the history of the court has been shaped by that mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. present sure. perspective. Sure. If that's not how we ought to do it, and I think uh, uh, we would agree that's not the best way to assess uh, judicial greatness. How should we assess judicial greatness and why is Nelson great? Okay. Um, I don't, again, mean, I don't mean to quibble about words, but I think I'm afraid that the word greatness um, almost inevitably um, carries, carries a distorting effect. Mm -hmm. I would prefer to, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think Nelson was an outstanding justice. I think he was an excellent, you know, first rate compared to other people who have sat on the court. Um, I would say a model or an exemplary justice. Um, the trouble with greatness is that it's it's a term obviously that's used in lots of areas outside of the law. And so when we use it applying to the law, we tend to to import a lot of the considerations, a lot of the connotations that that word carries. And so among those are originality. Um, personal strength, um, personal impact, the ability to to impress oneself um, upon whatever subject it is. And I'm not sure that those are the most desirable qualities in a judge. Um, I quote in the article, I see if I can remember exactly right, but Carl Swisher, um, his his somewhat dismissive sounding appraisal of Nelson. He called him a stable, sound, and unspectacular judge. <laughs> I mean, it raises the question, is spectacularity or spectacularness really a desirable quality in a judge? Um, and, you know, I, I would say by itself, no, um, unless it mean unless it's being spectacularly scrupulous or spectacularly careful or... Mm. Um, spectacular in those respects. And so, yeah, um, again, as there's, there's his legal history, it's, it seemed to me from my, my meager experience of it, um, is more affected than other areas of history by the, the practical implications of what one finds and it's it's hard to disassociate one's ranking or one's assessment of a judge from as you've said before right what you know um what one thinks about the cases and what one thinks about the principles involved mm -hmm. um and but it's i think for that reason it's all the more important to to keep keep those things clear and make it clear, you know, is one saying um, this is a judge whose rulings I agree with or whose rulings, you know, would would suit us today versus is this a judge who did his job appropriately um, by the standards of the time? Um, and even again, even by standards that are perhaps perhaps sort of transcend particular areas, again, like lawfulness like um like the rule of law i think another just another point too which is that um there's an there's an overemphasis i would argue on constitutional cases in supreme court history and that's understandable because those are the ones that have yes the biggest impact those are the ones that that unsettle or or remake the law but those aren't actually most of the business of the Supreme Court. Um, and even today, and especially in Nelson's time, most cases were not constitutional. They were in they were more technical fields of law. And you can't assess a Supreme Court justice as such unless you say, you know, this is strictly a constitutional law assessment. 
you can't assess one without looking at all those specialized fields of law. Um, so admiralty, um, patents, Indian law, land law, um, which were all very important and a very important part of a justice's workload. And yet, I think reputations get founded almost exclusively on, on constitutional cases. And if you, if you incorporate those, then I think Nelson looks even better because he was, I think his, rec his record on constitutional cases, which is what I emphasize in the article, was good. Um, but he was also the court's chief expert on admiralty and on patents. Um, and he wrote some notable opinions in, in other areas. And that, that I think adds up to a more impressive judicial record than, than you get simply by looking at the, at the, the, the important, you know, the, the celebrated ones, um, Dred Scott, the prize cases and, and the others that he's mostly associated with. Well, thank you for that very thoughtful and very thorough answer. And it's such a thoughtful article, um, which I recommend to mm -hmm. everyone. Once again, I've spoken today to Professor William Meyer, Associate Professor of Geography at Colgate University, who's the author of this wonderful article in uh, volume 48, number three of the Journal of Supreme Court History, and it's called Samuel Nelson and Judicial Reputation. Thank you for joining me, Professor Meyer. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.